I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today to hear Bart Bronikowski's talk. He's coming to us today from the discipline of sociology and from Harvard. Because he's going to be talking about his research trajectory, I'm not going to go over all of his accomplishments. However, I do want to indicate that his accomplishments are many. So, for example, he was recently a fellow at Stanford University. He's a co-director of a research cluster on global populism and the future of democracy. And he has published in top sociology journals, such as the American Sociological Review, the British Journal of Sociology, Social Forces, and the Annual Review of Sociology. So please join me in welcoming Bart. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure to speak with many of you over the past uh, day, and I look forward to speaking with a few more of you today. Um, I'm delighted to share some of my work with you. This talk will be it's kind of a general overview of uh, the way I think about the rise of radical politics, which is um, something I'm writing a book about right now. And then I'll kind of drill down to one piece of the puzzle uh, with an empirical, uh, empirical paper that, uh, that's part of this talk. Um, during the, the search committee meeting yesterday, I, I talked about one project on populism that is primarily based on text analysis. The empirical paper I'll present toward the latter half of today's talk uh, also involves text analysis, so for the, although text analysis is playing more of a supportive role in this case. So it's a combination of text analysis and, uh, and survey analysis. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, and if, uh, if this image was a ch uh, sort of triggered anyone, and my apologies, there'll be a few more. Uh, if you follow European politics, you will know that over the past, let's say, 20 years or so, uh, a number of characters have appeared on the political scene who are typically classified as radical right. Uh, and this cast of character, characters grows by the year, so every time I present this, I have to add more pictures. Um, now, we can talk about what the radical right means, and I will do that. Uh, it's a technical term. It's not supposed to be a negative term, necessarily. Uh, but even if you don't follow uh, European politics, you will recognize the character from closer to home. And so this rise of radical right parties and radical radical right actors raises a few puzzles, three in particular. First, what is the radical right? Second of all, why has it been surging in recent years? And finally, what are the potential consequences of this development for, for liberal democracy? Both the liberal side of liberal democracy and the democracy side of liberal democracy. Um, today, I'll be talking primarily about the second question, why this form of politics have been surging. But to get there, I'll touch a little bit on the first. And I think the third one I'll leave for the q if, if anyone's interested so speaking about, to, to talk about how, um, how some of the governance strategies that these politicians use might erode liberal democratic norms and institutions. Uh, really, there are four main claims of the, of the paper that I'll, I'll be speaking about today. The first is that nationalism is actually an essential phenomenon for understanding the rise of radical right politics. Uh, this is sort of a, you know, one of the core features of, of this form of politics, and its, um, uh, its importance sort of stands alongside populism and authoritarianism, which are the other two elements of, of this political uh, form. Nationalist cleavages, as I'll argue and hopefully show you uh, and convince you empirically, um, have long been latent in the U.S. population. And in recent years, um, um, they've become more manifest and more mobilizable. Um, but actually, interestingly, the aggregate, aggregate prevalence of nationalist attitudes has not changed much over time. So that's a bit of a puzzle. How can we see the rise of radical politics when the aggregate attitudes are pretty stable? Both in the US, and this is actually true of European countries as well. Um, as I mentioned, in recent years, you've, you've seen the, the, the political mobilization of these otherwise latent cleavages. And the reason, I would argue, that these cleavages have become all of a sudden mobilizable is that um, there's been a, a very steady uh, and quite rapid partisan sorting of nationalist beliefs. So that in the 1990s, you couldn't predict how somebody understood the nation based on their partisan affiliation and vice versa. By the 2000s, you can. Um, and in the US, this is primarily between, obviously, the two parties. In, Europe, in the European context, there's a similar sorting of nationalism by party families. Uh, so in the talk today, I'll mostly focus on the US, but uh, many of the claims I'm making work in the European context as well. So the plan is to first talk about uh, what nationalism is and how it fits into the broader model of the rise of radical politics. Um, give you a kind of a broad overview of a theoretical model for why I think radical politics have been, has been surging in recent years, and that's kind of the model that I'm developing in the book project. Uh, 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 propose some hypotheses based on actual textual analysis of candidate speeches for why um, nationalism, or whether nationalism uh, was predictive of 2016's can, uh, candidate support, and then also uh, what's happened to nationalist beliefs over time, how they have 
uh, shifted in their distribution in the US population. Uh, and finally, after I show you the results, um, maybe I'll get to the last piece about implications for democracy. Um, so first, what is the radical right? So as I've sort of alluded already, um, you know, there are many, many terms out there that are thrown around loosely in the media and scholarship, but really, the radical right has three primary elements, and this comes from Kasmuda's work and, and a number of other scholars. First is populism, which in a nutshell is a way of making political claims that juxtaposes, morally juxtaposes some sort of a corrupt elite with a virtuous people. And sort of claims that, that the elites have uh, forsaken the people's interests and are, are fundamentally opposed to the people's interests. Um, the second, the one I'll focus on today, is ethnonationalism. And I'll get into a definition of that in a second. And the final one is authoritarianism, which is mostly uh, a, a way of governing. It's a way of governing that seeks to represent the interests of the people, often defined in quite uh, bounded ways, uh, often by violating accepted democratic norms and, uh, and subverting democratic institutions. Uh, and it's a way of staying in power and continuing to represent the interests of this particular group that's defined as a people as a whole. Um, so really, I want to focus on ethnonationals, but I'm happy to Q&A to talk about the other two components as well, and I've studied all three. Um, when people think of nationalism, often the assumption is that we're talking about say, national identity as a whole, right? So that uh, you can distill the national character of the United States or France and sort of uh, juxtapose their, their distinct features. That's not what I mean. What I mean by um, nationalism are sort of the cognitive schemas, the cultural models that people have in their minds that are also available in, in the public uh, culture uh, through which people understand what the nation means to them and what their relationship to the nation is. So what might... Uh, what might what, what attitudes and beliefs might go into the, these cultural schemas? Well, for one, um, who is a literal member of the nation and who's not? So you can imagine, for some people, um, religion is not a relevant category uh, for delineating uh, national membership. Anybody from any religion can be a member of the nation. Uh, for others, uh, for example, ethnicity and national origin is an important criterion of national membership. Somebody else might not care about race in the sense that they think that, uh, that the U.S. Is a, is a country based on diversity, a country of a nation of immigrants. Um, for others, race is a really important uh, factor determining um, national membership. Same with language, religion, and so forth. But the, the symbolic values of the nation are not the only thing that, um, that, is, that comprises people's um, understanding of, of the nation. It's also about people's relationship to the state, whether the state is something to be celebrated or something to be afraid of. It's about the nation's position in the global order. So for example, people's conceptions of what the role of the military is. Is the military a force as good as a humanitarian force or the policeman of the world? So these various beliefs about what the nation means, uh, I would argue, um, add up to these cognitive networks. Uh, and the, the assumption here is that, this comes from cultural sociology, that meaning is relational. To understand what any given attitude, belief, symbol, uh, means, you need to place it in the context of other symbols and beliefs. Um, and so, Extending that metaphor to the images that you just saw, we, you know, you can imagine that these these attitudes that I've, I've, I've illustrated with these photos actually add up to two different cognitive networks, right? So maybe this, these represent people, or uh, you know, one person or an entire group. So for this person, the nation uh, is inclusive. Anyone in principle can be a member of the nation. The state is to be celebrated. The military is a force of good, and so forth. For this hypothetical person on the right. Um, the nation means something quite different, right? You've got religious boundaries, you've got linguistic boundaries, you've got a, a kind of a, a vilification of the state, and a very different understanding of the nation's projection of power abroad. <coughs> so, in principle, if, we, if you buy this, if you follow me so far, this should be measurable using a variety of methods. You should be able to measure this with survey data, you should be able to measure this with text data. Um, in past work, I've done the survey piece of this uh, through a number of papers. And what's emerged from that work is a pretty consistent finding that these nationalist beliefs that I sort of illustrated with these, with these pictures um, constitute very robust and stable nationalist cleavages in the population. That is that we can identify these clusters of beliefs and that they hang together quite consistently. Um, and you know, no matter how you define the model, no matter what data you use, they seem to come up again and again. And not only in the United States, but also in um, and the key thing to understand here is that these cleavages um, mean that there's within country heterogeneity, tremendous within country heterogeneity how people understand the nation. So it's not just that Americans understand their nation differently than the French, it's that within the United States there's a lot of disagreement about what America means. Um, they're essentially competing models of American um, nationhood, national identity. 
the, the work that I alluded to, my past work, has identified four clusters in particular that seem to come up again and again across cases and over time. I've called them liberal, restrictive, ardent, and disengaged, uh, and I'll get to the meaning of those in, in a minute. Um, they're patterned, they're stable, they are uh, consistently predictable by such demographic characteristics of, of survey respondents, they're rooted in everyday experience, and as I mentioned, they constitute these latent cleavages <coughs> that can, in principle, be activated politically uh, at particular historical moments. And in the, before the early 2000s, they did cut across ideology, they cut across party ID, and they cut across other category, categories like race. What has not been examined in past work is whether these nationalist cleavages predict voting preferences. And that's the main objective of the paper I'll describe today. So that's what the radical right is. Um, why has it been surging? That's the million dollar question that many, many articles and books have been written about. Um, mostly by political scientists, much less so by sociologists, which is actually too bad. Sociology used to be the primary discipline that, or one of the primary disciplines that dealt with electoral politics and institutional politics, and it sort of ceded that territory to political science in the 70s, I think for the worse. Um, the fact that after the 2016 election, sociologists had very little to say about what happened is a problem. Uh, so I, I really see my work as connecting the two disciplines, political science and sociology. Um, so why has it been surging? Um, the, the short version of the answer is that the nationalist cleavages I've identified are the fuel anti-elitism and low institutional trust um, that, that are evoked by populist claims, stoke the fire, and then tolerance for authoritarian rule is the consequence of this process. But in all cases, both on the uh, supply side of politics, that is in political discourse, and the demand side of politics, which is attitudes, these frames and beliefs are actually quite steady over time. It's not that they're increasing um, uh, over time in, 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 uh, in a big way, and I'll explain to you why it's important. So if the frames have been around for a while, if the beliefs have been around for a while, how can we explain change with stasis, right? That seems strange. So what I argue for is the need to think about resonance. That is that the way that sociologists used to think in social movements research about the resonance of, of claims and frames is that as, as, once you've got um, the correspondence of a frame with a belief, you've got mobilization, political mobilization, people support that movement or that party. But in more recent years, people have suggested, well, actually, that's not really what happens. You need the right conditions for resonance as well. Um, so it's not just about the matching of frames and beliefs, it's also about a particular set of structural, contextual features that make those beliefs and frames resonate. So you can have pre-existing frames, pre-existing beliefs that don't resonate for a while, and then as conditions change, they begin to resonate and, and become politically relevant. Um, why, might, why might have these frames and beliefs resonated in recent years? Um, I'll give you some more examples, but in, in a nutshell, there are a number of grievances that stem from rapid cultural, political, demographic change across countries in the U.S. included. Some of these are real changes, some of them are perceived changes that have impacted the, the status, the perceived group status of majority popul uh, populations, particularly white Americans and white um, uh, majorities in European countries. Some of these changes have been experienced directly by people in their everyday lives, like uh, industrialization, economic crises. Others are mediated by the media, literally by political elites, through social networks. So that it is not necessarily that I'm suffering, but people like me may be suffering or will be suffering in the future. You can fill in the blank of what people like me means. Um, so these are often perceived affronts to group identity, not just to your own individual life. But life chances, dignity, moral commitments, and so forth. The fears that these changes have, have evoked have then been uh, channeled by politicians and media personalities into resentments toward elites, but also toward outgroups, ethnic, religious, and racial outgroups. So which changes matter? Which of these structural changes might matter? I'll give you a few examples. Obviously, economic changes matter, and this has been a large uh, uh, discussion in the literature, whether it's economic or cultural. Obviously, economics matter, and there's a lot of research in, in economics on this that, that's quite excellent. Um, but economic changes are not just about crises, it's also about processes of deindustrialization. <laughs> um, but also, beyond economic changes. It's, all, it's about immigration, about demographic change. Uh, it's about terrorism and the way that uh, national security threats have been linked to immigration, again, by uh, elites. It's about policies like affirmative action, which in principle seem to not fit very well with the other uh, shock that I mentioned. Uh, but actually, if you think about this notion that, that the white majority is feeling a status threat and it feels like the rules are changing, it begins to fit much, um, much more neatly. It's also about changes in popular culture, the replacement of people like this, who represented the heart of the nation at some point in our cultural history, to a very different uh, demographic makeup of, of popular culture. Now, I'm not claiming that Hollywood is entirely diverse and that it's, you know, everyone's represented equally. It's not at all the case. 
But the who celebrated uh, in the <coughs> has certainly changed. It's about the vilification in the US case, although not elsewhere, of the first black president, uh, which we know a lot about from the birther movement and onward, and about social movements for racial justice. The key theme here is that the shocks often come from minority groups or from perceptions of, of changing demographics and changing status hierarchies. Um, and the other thing to take away from this is that this story is multi-causal. That is, some of these, some of these shocks, some of these changes are likely to be relevant in the US, but probably not elsewhere. Um, so, you know, if you think about Poland, there was no economic shock. Poland actually weathered the economic crisis really well. But there are other shocks that were relevant in that case. And I'll talk about them toward the end. Um, so here's the model in a slightly more formalized uh, sense. So you've got the supply side of politics, which is political discourse. You've got the demand side of politics, which are beliefs and attitudes. And uh, the three categories of phenomena I mentioned, nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism, both on the discourse and the attitude side. And for most part, there's stability over time. That is, these frames have been around for a while. The beliefs are quite stable in their aggregate distribution. But underneath that stability, there is actually something happening. So on the supply side, there's a recombination of populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism over time by parties in Europe and elsewhere, right? So they try out one frame, it sticks, they try out something else, it sticks, and they eventually they arrive at kind of a winning formula for, for, uh, for authoritarian nationalist and populist claims making. And I'm actually tracing that process using text analysis, kind of an evolutionary model of cultural change across European countries. Um, there's also the fusion of these beliefs so that populism starts standing in for nationalism. So another paper I've got using survey experiments that shows that if you expose people to purely anti-elite discourse, they will have stronger antipathies towards minorities in the U.S. case. Yeah, go ahead. Just a quick clarificational question. <clears throat> what time frame are you talking about sure. when you say things have been stable for a while? Yeah. We're talking 10 years, 20 years, 100 years? That's a good question. So the data that are available uh, are for about 30 to 40 years. Um, there's other research using non-comparable data that suggests that there's always been kind of this reservoir of voters. Um, so uh, the, uh, Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt have a book, How Democracies Die, where they claim that there's always been, in their case, authoritarian attitudes have been always, 35% like, of the population has had authoritarian views, but they don't always vote based on those views. So I sort of, uh, I'm on board with that, with that argument. Uh, but the data I have, the survey data I have, go from the 80s on, the, and, and you know, the rise of radical right politics in Europe and the United States, especially in Europe, started in the 80s and really took off in the 90s. So that's kind of the relevant time frame. Uh, and uh, the text analysis project I mentioned about the, kind of the, the combination of these frames uh, takes us from the late 70s through to now using uh, comparative manifesto data. On the demand side, you've got aggregate stability, but partisan sorting over time, which means that although in the aggregate people haven't changed their mind about what the nation means, the party, sort of party uh, um, uh, uh, supporters have. So you've got stability, but reconfiguration of who believes what. At the same time, you've got these shocks that I mentioned. Some of them are perceived, some of them are real. They're sort of creating anxiety, and are the fears that result are channeled into our representments, which then leads to a perceived collective status threat. One final piece of this is that as these beliefs are sorting, you also have the erosion of older identities, like labor identities. With the decline of unions in the United States, and also to some degree in Europe, You've got a, 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 what used to be a very strong political collective identity has eroded, and nationalism becomes more salient and fills in the gap. So another project is trying to understand whether nationalist expression um, on Twitter and elsewhere has been increasing. Um, of course, that's a much shorter time frame. Um, finally, when you've got this sort of perfect storm, what happens is that these cleavages that were previously uh, latent become mobilized, and as a result, you've got radical right success. And a key piece of this is that once that happens, you've got a diffusion. So a lot of politicians across countries start mimicking one another in terms of how they do <coughs> politics, in terms of the authoritarian measures that they take once they're elected um, and, and, um, and acquire power. Okay, that's a book model, which I cannot possibly get to in the talk. What I'll get to today is this. <laughs> Identifying the national cleavage, showing you how they change over time, um, how they sort across parties, and presumably, well, yeah, how they end up leading to the support for radical right politics. I'll also talk a little bit about, on the supply side, on, about national dis nationalist discourse. This is the text analysis piece, which helps me figure out how to hypothesize this particular relationship. So the empirical strategy is twofold. First, to you, well, not first, but uh, first in the talk at least, is to use repeated cross-sectional survey data to identify these varieties of nationalism that I talked about. 
using latent class analysis, which I'll get into more. Um, generate hypotheses based on the candidates' framing of the nation in their campaign speeches. That's a text analysis piece using word embeddings, word to vec in particular. And then model the association, association between the national schema to the individual level and 2016 primary and general election candidate preferences. By the way, well, I'll tell you about the data in a minute. Um, and finally, examine the long-term trends in the distribution of nationalism at the demand side, um, both in the aggregate and by party. So the survey data, um, this time period is a little shorter than, than the one I described to you, Jeff. So it was 1996 to 2004, uh, using the GSS uh, and IFSB. And then I supplement that with two surveys I collected myself, uh, 2012 GFK survey and 2016 YouGov survey. And in particular, this last one, we collected the data the weekend before the election in 2016. So it was really close to the actual voting decision, and there's a lot of research in political science suggesting that that's kind of the optimal time to, to, sur to survey people. Um, and so this is the survey I use for the prediction of voting preferences, and then the repeated cross-sections I use for the trends. Um, the specific items that, uh, survey items that they're including in the analysis are measures of attachment to the nation, criteria of national membership, who's a legitimate member, who's not, uh, various uh, criteria of national pride, which to some degree get at some of the populist aspects of nationalism, and chauvinism, perceptions of how the nation fits into the broader world. So kind of the, you know, equivalence to the, to the images I showed you before. On the text side, um, we've got campaign speeches uh, scraped from a couple of sources. Factbase is a website that has um, aggregated everything Donald Trump has ever said from the late 1970s to today. Um, and the UCSB American Presidency Project tracks political speeches um, in primary and, and, um, and in general elections, as well as some other, other uh, political discourse. So we've got, this is not huge data. This is probably more on the side of small data. We talked about this a little yesterday. But it's what, we, what we've got. So there are 116 primary election speeches by um, multiple candidates, and then 134 general election speeches. The model we use is a word embeddings model using words of ec. Um, I'm happy to talk about what this, how this model works in the Q&A if you're interested. Essentially uses a shallow neural network uh, to map words, or sort of, sort of uh, to, to translate words into dense vectors. Um, and the dense vectors, I think I should I have a picture? No, I don't have a picture. Uh, I'll get to it later. Uh, the dense vectors are, you choose the, the, the dimensions of the vector, the, the length of the vector. Uh, the numbers in the vector have no inherent meaning. But the vectors allow you to map words in multidimensional space, and then proximity between words maps onto similarity in their meaning. So sort of an inductive way of mapping meanings in any given corpus. Now, because I can do that separately to the different candidates, we can tell how the same concept differs in its meaning across the candidates. So um, the two concepts I'll focus on today, we played around with other ones, is how, how threats to the nation are framed, which is quite revealing about what the nation means to the candidate and how political elites are framed, which gets at some of the populist aspects of, of the frames I'm talking about. So we'll look at what dangerous means, and we'll look at what politics means to the different candidates. Um, the word to model is actually quite intuitive, uh, although it's complicated mathematically. Um, but the, the survey-based model may be a little less intuitive, so I'll talk about it for a second. <laughs> What, what, what is it? Is it the I'm not sure. I'm curious, too. Outside. Outside. Oh, it's outside. I think Robert was helpful. Oh, yeah. All right. So that was a little quick. Um, <laughs> so how do, we, how do I measure nationalist beliefs using survey data? Um, I use a method called latent class analysis. So as I mentioned to you, meaning is relational in the way that sociologists think about it. So it makes sense to study survey data in a relational manner as well. So that any given survey item, its meaning comes from its relationship to other survey items. Um, and uh, let me give you an example. If I ask you, how important is it to speak English to be a true American? What your answer can't tell me whether you're an ethno-nationalist or whether you kind of believe that language is an important prerequisite to political and economic participation. But if I find out how you answer a bunch of other questions, then all of a sudden the meaning of that first question becomes much more clear. So um, I can get into the model specification if you like, but let me give you more of an of a intuitive sense of how this works. So imagine this is a data set. You've got variables in the columns, and you've got rows and uh, 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 respondents observations in the rows. Uh, and each one of these numbers represents an answer. I'm fine with it, although I, you may not. OK, so, uh, right, so you've got observations and variables. The numbers correspond to responses on some sort of a survey question, right? So imagine this is how important is uh, 
uh, American ancestry for being a true American. This person on the scale from one to four believes it's not very important. This person believes it's very important. And then a number of other questions. What lane class analysis essentially allows you to do is to detect patterns of responses across multiple questions by respondent. So all of a sudden, you start realizing, oh wait, person A, person C, and person F actually responded to these questions in, a, in an identical way in this case. It's never quite that pretty. Um, person B, D, and E have another response profile, and then person G is sort of an isolate. Nobody else has, thinks of the nation the same way as this person. And so the next step then is to cluster these people based on these response profiles. Um, now, of course, there are a few assumptions in this. A, that survey uh, questions actually measure people's beliefs. Uh, that similar profiles mean same beliefs as a result. Uh, you know, that's, those are common assumptions of survey research, uh, and we can talk about how, you know, how one can test for those to some degree. Um, but in, the, in essence, if, if we imagine that these are attitudes about the nation, then we've got three different ways of understanding the nation. So that's what we do. Um, we take uh, 5,000 observations, 23 national variables, and we enter that into the latent class analysis model. There's a lot of modeling, a lot of modeling decisions that go into this. And what we essentially end up with are four latent classes, or four <coughs> attitudinal profiles, four ways of understanding the nation. Uh, what are they? So I already mentioned the names. They're creedal nationalist, restrictive nationalist, ardent nationalist, and disengaged. Um, there's some, some debate with, with my work about whether disengaged is a form of nationalism, or it's sort of orthogonal to nationalism, is a lack of nationalism, and that's certainly something worth, worth talking about. But it's one way of understanding the nation. Um, so this is what their content is. I don't expect you to be able to read that, so I'll just simplify it. <laughs> um, so if we've got these four clusters, a bunch of variables here grouped into these categories. Um, two things to notice. One is that there's variation, obviously, across the four clusters, but also that that variation is cross-cutting. So it's not just going from least nationalist to most nationalist. They're actually different configurations of beliefs. Um, so the creedal nationalists are sort of your standard American national creed. Moderate attachments, civic, civic meaning inclusive uh, uh, symbolic boundaries of the nation. High levels of pride, but mo only moderate levels of chauvinism. Right? So this is kind of centrist, kind of liberal with a small L, creedal nationalism that's long been established in the United States. The second category is what we call restrictive, and these people are high in national attachment, have a pretty ethno-nationalist understanding of symbolic boundaries of the nation, so ethnicity, religion, ancestry matter for who's a true American. But, interestingly, low levels of pride, particularly in state institutions, and only in moderate chauvinism. So in some ways they resemble the, the credos, in other ways they're quite different from them. Ardent nationalists are kind of high across the board, right? So. High degrees of attachment, ethno-religious conception of national identity, high levels of pride, high levels of chauvinism. These are sort of jingoistic Americans, right? Rah, rah, America, America for us, and America's the greatest, and we're very proud of it. And then the disengaged, who are kind of low across the board. Moderate attachment, inclusive uh, criteria of national membership, low levels of pride, and low levels of chauvinism. Now notice again, it's cross-cutting, right? So the disengaged share some qualities with the restrictive. Both are have low levels of pride, particularly institutions. But then they share um, other uh, uh, characteristics with creedals, right? So both are civic nationalist criteria of membership. Um, so it's, I know it's a lot to keep in your mind, but the point is that there, there's kind of a, there are clear distinctions between these clusters based on who's in and who's out in terms of legitimate membership in the nation, what we should be proud of, and where the nation stands in the world. Yes? Would it also make sense to include the variability for some of these categories? Because uh, mm -hmm. some of them will be consistent. With some of yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are different ways of doing that. So um, one is to just look at, um, yeah, basically variance in any given response within a class. Um, and I think when we did that, they were pretty consistent from what I remember. There's another way which we actually use in the paper which is to look at um, the distribution of class assignment probabilities. So latent class analysis um, generates two kinds of posterior probabilities. The first is a continuous probability of assignment to any given class for any given respondent. And so you may have you know, 5% or you know, 0.05 probability of belonging to class one, 0.05 for the second, 0.8 to the third, and 0.10 to, uh, to the fourth, in which case you'll be assigned to the third class, so sort of based on the modal probability. And so what you can do is look at how, how well does the model predict an assignment to any of the, four, of the four classes. So is one class kind of messier than the others? And, and on that front, there isn't much, much variability. So all four classes are equally well predicted and equally well separated from one another. Um, but but the, other, the other point is quite, quite important. And the, you know, the way that we can actually do that in the, oh, it's gonna take me a while. That big graph, um, it shows you, you know, these are the classes. Uh, and it shows you the distribution of responses for each item. So I, it's not just the mean, but it's actually the ordinal categories, right? So in this case, strongly disagree 
is a really big part of uh, membership criteria for restrictives um, and so forth. So there's a little bit of that already in the paper as well. Okay. Um, so then the two questions that come out of this is, do these beliefs predict candidates supporting the election, and how do these beliefs change in their distribution over time? Um, there's, a, again, a long debate in political science and the, in the press post-2016 whether is it economics or is it culture that predicts Trump's support and the support for electoral politics. Uh, it's a reasonable question to some degree, although I think it's, a, it's, just, it's also a problematic binary because <laughs> economic grievances are often filtered through cultural categories. Uh, sometimes they're only perceived through cultural categories, obviously. Um, but also, there's another problem, and that is that a lot of the scholars and, and media personalities that talk about this group everything under culture that is not economic, right? So it's xenophobia, it's Islamophobia, it's racism, and so forth. All of that is cultural. But there is no actual theoretical concept that organizes how those things, uh, things sort of add up to one coherent um, phenomenon. And that's where nationalism can, can be an important way of thinking about it. That is, if you're sort of a strong ethno-nationalist boundaries of the nation, then you're likely to exclude people based on all of these criteria. Um, and then, um, this basically what I'm, what I'm arguing is that this model of nationalism gives us a way of understanding all of these outgroup sentiments along with pride, chauvinism, and the other elements of, of nationalist beliefs. And we know that there were differences in Trump's, Clinton's, and the other, the other candidates' uh, campaign speeches and campaign discourse. We know that because we probably remember the election. We also know that because we can look at media reports. But there actually hasn't been much systematic research on this. So rather than just assume things based on how I remember 2016, we thought it would make sense to actually systematically study that using text analysis. And that allows us to generate hypotheses. When I say we, there's a, this is co author with the graduates, my colleague. Um, and then this allows us to test the native upsurge assumption. That is, there's this, an assumption in the literature that the reason we're seeing the rise of radical parties is that nationalism, ethnonationalism, xenophobia, racism have been skyrocketing. Right? So we can actually see if that's the case. And I've already suggested to you that that's not the case. So, how do the campaigns vary? Well, they vary in many ways. Um, I guess two kind of evocative examples, or one evocative example, is the difference between the Democratic and Republican national conventions. Right, so Republican national convention, the wall, vilifying immigrants and so forth. The Democratic national convention, you know, Clinton presenting America as a nation of immigrants and a nation of diversity. So we know that that's there, but how do we think about it from a more systematic perspective? So I mentioned to you that, I'll just show you results for two words. Um, for dangerous, which is sort of think how people think about the danger presented to the nation, and politics, which is how people think about elites and political representation. So these are 50 closest terms to dangerous for Trump. And again, this is a, a, a two-dimensional projection of a word embedding space that actually has 100 dimensions. Um, so it's not perfect, but it gives you a sense. So the things that Trump associated in his discourse, that is, terms that were closely related to dangerous, were things like terror, Things like drug, cartels, gangs, violent, but also refugees, right? Syndicates, traffickers, visas, pouring over the borders, aliens, right? There's a conflation of immigration, of terrorism, of sort of otherness of all sorts as a, as a dangerous threat to the nation. And so by knowing what he was railing against, we have a sense of what he was protecting, what kind of America he was protecting. <laughs> in terms of how he thought about politics, um, so in blue here are some more positive terms, so independence, smartest, smartest for short, stability, embrace, faith, and so forth. But then negative ones are a ton of them, right? Failed, failures, arrogant, entrenched, squandered, elitism, cynicism, machine politics, establishment, victims, bitter, control, corrupt, and so forth. So railing against the political establishment is also a strong part of his discourse. When we look at Clinton, what's dangerous to America? Discrimination, bullying, harassment, right? Threat, and then Russia, Partisanship, Mexican, in this case, it's sort of, um, we looked into what this meant, and it was actually discrimination against Mexican immigrants, uh, not uh, the threat of Mexicans. So what she's arguing for are the threats to diversity and to liberal democracy. If you look at what, how she thought of politics, it's primarily in terms of values, respect, uh, participation, prosperity, contribution, growth, and so forth. So politics as a, as a solution to problems. And to the degree that she talks about in, terms of, in negative terms, it's typically to either portray Trump's, Trump or other uh, people who would uh, uh, subvert American democracy. And then we can do this for the other, uh, the other candidates. And I, I, <coughs> in terms of time, I'll just give you an actual point that Sanders um, does not talk about nationalism much. He talks about economic nationalism, which is a, quite a different category that I'm having to talk about. So potential, so he talks about uh, 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 exemplars in terms of how social welfare system works. He sometimes talks about uh, threats in terms of uh, globalization. Uh, but for most part, nationalism just doesn't enter his discourse. But he rails against elites in a similar way to Trump. 
right? On different criteria and different elites, primarily economic elites, but there's a lot of negative um, language about elites. Establishment, corrupted, uh, and so forth. Billionaires, right? And we can do this for mainstream Republicans who turn out to look a lot like Clinton in the sense that there isn't kind of, a, there's kind of a civic nationalism at the core, uh, and there isn't much of a critique of political establishment, mostly positive terms. Uh, we can do that for Cruz as well. And Cruz actually, the sample for Cruz is much smaller, so it's hard to tell exactly where he place, places, but seems much more similar to Trump. And there's literature suggesting that he kind of drifted toward a Trump-like campaign over time. Um, so this leads to some hypotheses. If we were to predict what kind of nationalist beliefs predict um, um, Trump's support over Clinton, we would expect that those nationalist beliefs that, um, that sort of exclude on ethnonationalist terms, in ethnonationalist terms, would lead to Trump's support over Clinton's support. So restrictive and ardent nationalism should be associated with Trump's support over Clinton. Um, and uh, the high bar here is whether this holds after controlling for party, um, which we can talk about. There's also the question of whether we should be thinking about this in the general or in the primary. For now, I'm talking about the general. Um, which is kind of interesting, actually, because most people think the general election is not important, because by then, people are just voting party. Republicans are voting Republican, Democrats are voting Democrat. So that's one argument. I would still say that voting for Trump, given his discourse, even if you're just voting for your party, is a statement of a particular set of beliefs. Um, and that seems to bear out in the, in the analysis. Um, uh, sorry, this is Clinton versus Trump is the inverse of this. So creedal um, and disengaged nationalism should be associated with Clinton over Trump. Uh, Trump versus moderates should be a similar relationship with, as Trump versus Clinton. So um, there should be, uh, uh, this is actually now in the primary, support for Trump as opposed to mainstream candidates should be associated with adherence to um, restrictive and urban nationalism. Trump versus Cruz, we don't, we're, you know, this was kind of a, a, a pretty weak hypothesis, but we didn't expect to see much difference. Clinton versus Sanders, this is not just Republican versus Democrat, right? So there's also a difference within the Democratic candidates and within the Republican ones, as I showed you. Um, so, because Sanders did not articulate his claims in nationalist terms, we should expect those who have this kind of arm's length relationship to the nation, that is the disengaged nationalists or disengaged, uh, to be more supportive of, of Sanders than Clinton. If you have any sort of nationalist beliefs, you should be more likely to support Clinton based on her evocation of nationalism in her, in her campaign. Um, and finally, the longitudinal uh, hypothesis that, that um, on the one hand, you can imagine that the exclusionary types of nationalism have surged over time, as some people have claimed. Um, or that actually there's stability, but there's sorting across party. I've already kind of foreshadowed which one is right. So the regression results are as follows. So this is Trump versus Clinton. First, kind of a base model where we just look at nationalism and voting preferences. Um, shouldn't labels, it doesn't. Then we add social demographic characteristics, sorry, I should, should say that there. And then we add party ID as well. And what you see is that consistently, Having more exclusionary nationalist beliefs is associated with support for Trump over Clinton in the general election, net of race, class, you know, et cetera, et cetera, and even net of uh, partisan identification. So even net of being Republican or Democrat, you still have greater support for Trump if you're ardent or restrictive nationalist versus creedal nationalist. So this relationship eventually washes out a little bit. Um, it's also important to note that there's this, it's not just about exclusion versus inclusion. That's a big part of it, obviously. But also here, if you're um, disengaged, you're more likely to vote for Trump than if you're creedal. That is, Trump articulated kind of a, 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 the negative message about political elites. If you have low pride in institutions, whatever you might think about national membership, you're more likely to vote for Trump than for Clinton. Trump versus moderates is a very similar story. So the moderate, this is in the primary, obviously. Um, so moderate Republicans had a similar campaign style, not the same policy issues and policy stances, but in terms of nationalism, a very sim similar campaign style to Clinton. And you have re relatively similar um, um, results. Here, because it's the primary, we're not controlling for party ID. We're just controlling for social democratic characteristics. Um, and then Trump versus Cruz, we see no big differences. But again, this is a very tentative finding, small sample, and all that. Um, in the Democratic primary, the results are also quite strong. That is, if you have an arm's length, well, before we get to the arm's length relationship, if you're um, an ardent nationalist, you're more likely to vote uh, for Clinton over Sanders. But more importantly, if you had an arm's length relationship to the nation, you're more likely to support Sanders. That is, you yourself don't, the nation doesn't hold much meaning to you. You have kind of a, an arm's length relationship to it. Sanders does not evoke nationalism in any meaningful way, whereas Clinton does. You end up supporting Sanders more strongly. Now, let me show you the results over time. Um, so first, this is the aggregate patterns. I'm not saying nothing is happening, but if you 
what, you know, with, the, with this one particular time period, which I'm happy to talk about, uh, with that aside, the overall aggregate distribution of these four types of nationalism over time in the, pop in the population is not a whole lot different in 2016 than it was in, in 1996. Right? You've got a slight reduction in, in restrictive nationalism. Um, creedal nationalism is pretty much where it was before. Uh, disengaged is pretty much where it was before, a little higher. And of course, you've got this one moment. So in the previous paper, I've shown that this one moment is 9-11. So it took uh, a, a punctuated historical um, shock of that magnitude to unsettle these beliefs, and then they come back to baseline shortly thereafter. Um, and you know that's consistent with literature on rally around the flag effects after major national security crises. So people sort of start supporting the the the, the, the presidency and the and the government, and they often become a little more um, exclusionary in their national beliefs. But again, there is a return to baseline. Of course, these are cross-sectional data. I don't have longitudinal data. In fact, they don't exist. But I'm hoping one day they will, if I can help it. Um, but again, not a whole lot happening between 1996 and 2016 when you take. 2004 out. If you look at party results, it's very different. So these are strong Democrats. Among strong Democrats, restricted nationalism, that is the nationalism that is exclusionary and has low levels of trust, pretty much disappears by 2016, whereas it was quite prevalent in 1996. Creedal nationalism, the kind of mainstream liberal centrist nationalism, increases sharply over that time. Strong Republicans, <clears throat> a very different set of uh, patterns. So creedal nationalism, which was the second most prevalent form of nationalism among Republicans in 1986, is almost gone by 2016. Restricted nationalism increases uh, as does disengagement from the nation. So there's very strong partisan sorting that's masked by an actual aggregate relative stability um, over time. And we can do that for weak and strong Republicans, but the, the, kind of the graph that really captures all of this is that if you look at um, the, uh, the polarization of these attitudes, this essentially shows you how much sorting there is by party. Uh, if you look at all forms of nationalism, it increases. If you look at inclusive versus exclusive, if you sort of group the foreign types into two binary categories, there's even a sharper increase. So this suggests to me that, first of all, national cleavages were central to the 2016 election, both in the primary and the general. That exclusion of nationalism was associated with Trump's support in both the primary and general, even that of party ID. That disengagement from the nation was not really predictive uh, very strongly of Trump versus Clinton, although a little bit, but really was quite powerful in predicting Sanders versus Clinton support in the primary. Um, that in the aggregate, if you look at the aggregate patterns that I mentioned, between 1996 and 2016, if anything, <coughs> nationalism is becoming slightly more inclusive. Uh, but in the meantime, there is massive partisan sorting over the same period of time. And note that that partisan sorting starts around 2004, not 2016. So that means that among Republicans, the demand for this kind of politics has been around and has been increasing for a while, which is why we get the Tea Party, which is why we get Sarah Palin, right? But it's only Trump that was able to articulate this message in this powerful way um, uh, as was required to capture the party. Broad, more broadly, um, I think this suggests, broader research in this suggests that um, uh, rather than thinking about kind of these cultural, broad cultural sources of radical right support, we need to be thinking about collective identity more, more uh, uh, directly. Um, thinking about it as latent cleavages that may be mobilized in certain historical moments. I think we need to integrate both the supply and demand sides of politics as well as the contextual conditions that make them resonate. Um, and nationalism, as a result, seems to be uh, yet another set of beliefs that are polarizing by party. You know, the, the political science literature shows that over the last 40 years, you've got more and more issues sorting by party, even though Americans don't seem to change their minds in general about issues. But more and more issues are now, issue positions are sorted by party, so that um, if you know somebody's partisan idea, you can predict a whole bunch of other attitudes that they might hold. So that means that there's much less to agree about. There's much less room for bipartisanship, for consensus, for compromise. Now, nationalism is not just yet another issue. It's a fundamental master identity. It's how we think about ourselves in very, very powerful ways. So if Republicans and Democrats can't agree about what America means, then we've got a potential serious problem for liberal democracy. Um, I hope I also showed you that there's some utility in combining political science topics with sociological insights and, and um, both text and survey-based methods. Just a note on the computational methods. I, I, although, again, it played a supporting role in this paper, I think I want to kind of uh, foreground a few ways I think about computational text analysis in the context of studying political culture. First, that I, you know, I, I said this in our previous conversations yesterday, I really believe that the use of these methods, like any other methods, should be driven primarily by theoretically and substantively interesting questions, not just by methodologicals or fireworks for their own sake. 
Um, text analysis is clearly unique affordances um, compared to other methods, but also has limitations. And so as a result, um, it would be, it's always good to triangulate multiple methods. Um, you know, in some ways, text analysis is just a sort of computational text analysis, just a more efficient way of getting to the similar answers that you could do with qualitative text analysis in the future, in the past. Um, but in some cases, at its best, it can reveal things that you couldn't see before. Um, both due to the magnitude of the data, but also the ability of these methods to inductively identify um, associations that are very difficult to identify by, by human coders. Um, it's extremely important to validate, 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 we talked about that yesterday, uh, and to have healthy skepticism toward one's results, and uh, certainly in, in past work with text analysis, I've, I've, you know, that's been a really important um, objective for me. Uh, and again, triangulation is important, and that means triangulation across methods, you know, whether it's combining surveys with experiments, with text analysis, and so forth, but it's also about just reading. You know, you need to know your corpus before you believe the results of what an algorithm spits out at you. Um, in terms of future work, um, I, I don't want to take too much time, but um, the main, you know, there's one paper that's already done, which I, I alluded to, which shows that in an experimental setting, if you expose people to populist frames, they end up holding stronger nationalist attitudes, so that essentially it suggests that these campaigns have fused populism and nationalism in a powerful way. There's a book that I mentioned that I'm working on, which is um, using, essentially exploring that theoretical model I showed you, using text analysis, survey experiments, um, and, uh, and survey analysis, as well as comparative historical analysis of Case, few cases. So that the same mechanism I showed you in that theoretical model seemed to work across cases with very different starting conditions and very different kind of cultural uh, conditions as well. So, you know, in the US, you've got the immigration issue um, that's quite central in the UK as well, but in the UK, it's not immigration from Mexico, obviously, and it's not even actually <coughs> immigration that led to support for Brexit, but actually immigration from within the EU, Polish immigration for the most part, uh, although towards the end of the campaign, Islamophobia also took a more important role. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, as well as other countries in the Western Northern Europe, it's another paper that we recently published, we show that actually the kind of nationalism we think is the good stuff, the civic nationalism, has been turned on its head by radical right actors. So that now there are these very powerful claims that you should exclude Muslims because of our very progressive uh, rights regimes with respect to women, uh, sexual minorities, and so forth. So the argument is Muslims are not supportive of these rights regimes, and therefore we should Exclusion. So it's exclusion based on arguments around inclusion and progressivism. And in that paper, we show that civic nationalism at the individual level is actually associated with stronger Islamophobia. And then the, the last case will be Poland, where you've got anti-Semitism without Jews and Islamophobia without Muslims. So you don't have demographic changes, but the arguments still work because they plug into long-standing nationalist narratives and the threat of what might come from, you know, when you serve <coughs> other countries. Um, I mentioned the diffusion of radical right frames in Europe. Um, there's also a project on the collective dynamics of national identification on Twitter. So under what circumstances do Americans think of themselves as American over time? What are the exogenous events that lead to the greater kind of collective identification in certain moments and what the half-life of that might be? Um, a big project on multiple collective identities among second-generation immigrants. Um, and a project only in sort of nascent stages around politics of disdain. That is, how do perceptions of being insulted by people higher up in the status hierarchy affect your political behavior, which is important for populism. That's that. Thank you. Okay, so at this point we'll open it up to questions, and I'll go ahead yeah. and let you field. Sure, my pleasure. Okay, and we can go interrupt. Uh, so what troves of data are out there that are, in some sense, yet untapped in this context? I mean, uh, you spoke about text, which I guess is accessible and also maybe is closest to the topic or narrative you're interested in. But obviously, there's image data, video. Is any of that relevant, or is it? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so, so image data is sort of the next frontier. Audio data, really important as well. Um, you know, there are big advances on both fronts, computer vision and, uh, and, other, and other fields. Uh, so it's something that sociologists have not really used much. Um, I can think of maybe one paper that tried to do this, but I think that's that's a really great idea in terms of future directions. So you know, this assumes that most of the relevant stuff in the campaign is what's said, but of course, there's literature. You know, Ben Moffat has a book on a populist style that is not just the discourse, but a presentation of self. It's you know, Trump eating burgers or a taco bowl, you know, or dressing in a certain way. Um, and same thing with politicians in, in in Europe, right? So being able to actually Analyze the the visual visual presentation of 
of the political self is really important. Uh, and of course, the other thing we know is that it's not just what is said, but how it is said. So fluctuations in tone, uh, you know, um, um, the kind of inflections that people use, all of that could be in principle uh, uh, used. And I think that that's a potentially really exciting frontier, one where ICS can be you know, contributing to, to, to the cutting edge and already is in other fields. So it'd be great to translate that into the social sciences. And then, of course, you know, there are also massive troves of, of other textual data that haven't been explored. Um, so, you know, this is kind of using whatever is easily available, but what can, one can imagine, you know, I, in another project I, I looked at 200,000, excuse me, European Parliament speeches, for example, were, you know, from the 90s through to the mid-2000s to see where populism might have come up and how people's um, relationship between national politics and European politics predicted people's reliance on, on populist claims. And so there, you know, the data were there because every, that by law every, every speech had to be translated into English, and uh, so that was slightly less a less obvious data source. But there are plenty of those. Uh, but I think you know other modes of, of communication are, are even more interesting and exciting potentially. That's great. Yeah. So thanks for the interesting talk. I mean, I, I kind of admire you sort of someone who dives into this stuff in a systematic way because it's a it's a you know these are a lot of hot button issues that people can get brought up about. Yeah. And it is polarizing, right? <laughs> um, I have just a simple question about. One of the, one of the uh, graphs you showed that had the red, blue, yellow yeah. uh, lines, can we go back to the yeah. first one? The aggregate one, yeah. Yeah, the aggregate one. So I understood that you know, there was a bump that happened in two, after 2001 due to 9-11. Yeah. And then I understood that um, for the most part, the, the uh, values at the right edge in 2016 were very similar to the values that are at the left edge. Yeah. And so there wasn't much change over that longer period of time. But one interesting change that I'd like, I'd just like you to talk about that I want to understand more is the one between the yellow and the red, which are seem to be quite further apart uh, in 1996 than they are in 2016. That's right. And so what does that, what is, what does that tell us? That tells us, so, so the distinction between these two forms of nationalism is that they're both exclusionary in terms of symbolic bounds, <coughs> but one had, with a, the restrictive one, which is the yellow one, uh, there is kind of a lower level of pride in the state institutions and, and, and uh, in the nation as a, as a whole. And so um, this form of nationalism has, did not decrease among Republicans, but it almost disappeared almost among dem Democrats. So that's what's explaining this dip over here, is that once you disaggregate it, um, you, you see that the, the bulk of this decrease was among Democrats. So um, for whatever reason, we can sort of conjecture here, uh, Democrats have become obviously less exclusionary, but also less unproud in some ways of the nation over time. Now I bet post 2016 we'll see some differences by party on the pride uh, measures at least, but probably not so much on the on the ethnic national measures. Does that help? Yeah. So just on your your definition of the radical right, um, one of the fun things that you can do now is pull up YouTube of say Biden in 1988 versus Biden mm. today, and and I just have you done the experiment of say running Obama 08 campaign speeches through, because you see videos of him saying a lot of the same things Trump did. So, that, first of all, two good points. One is YouTube is a great source of data, period. Um, but also, um, what the, the frames themselves change over time, uh, and they are not exclusively wedded to one party or another. So one thing I mentioned in our meeting yesterday is that within a past paper on populism, you actually see populist claims being used by both Democrats and Republicans over time, um, and in two interesting ways. One is that it's so overall, the, I think the, the distribution is quite even across the two parties, but there's fluctuation over time quite a bit. Uh, and that fluctuation happens not just between the parties, but between, cam uh, between multiple campaigns by the same candidate. So you've got Nixon in the first campaign relying on populism, less so in the second campaign, <coughs> even less so in the third campaign, so I mentioned that yesterday, right? Because the, the claims to, to sort of being anti-elite become less and less credible the more and more you are perceived to be a member of the elite. Uh, and you can see the same thing on the Democratic side. So populism is by no means the property of the right only. Although, which elites are vilified varies quite a bit. So on the right, typically the elites are bureaucrats, uh, politicians, and intellectuals and we show that in that paper. On the left, it's typically economic elites, sometimes in cahoots with, with political elites. So that's the populism side. Um, the nationalism side, let me see if it gets this. The nationalism side, um, again, the claim is not that uh, only Republicans, so this is, by the way, this is the populism thing over time. Right? It's Democrats and Republicans, there's a lot of change over time, and we can talk about some of the other results. Um, so what about the radical left? So populism is a key feature of the radical left as well. 
right? Anti-economic elite populism. And we see the resurgence of that in recent years, actually, right? So, you know, Sanders and Warren, um, in Europe we've got uh, Podemos, right? Before that, Indignados in Spain, uh, and so forth. Syriza and Greece. Authoritarianism has been, is less obvious in the European and US context, but it was quite prevalent in Latin America. So left populism in Latin America had very strong authoritarian components. Nationalism, ethno so, I mean, nationalism as a whole is quite often used on both sides. But the kind of nationalism that's articulated is often quite different. So Obama in 2008 certainly relied on nationalist frames, but those frames are, were much more similar to Clinton's. So it was sort of a, the, the, the arguments were that nation's important, we're all part of one nation, he would go to, you know, it sort of allowed him to go to the Midwest and say to, to white workers in, in the industrialized zones, like, you are part of the nation, I represent you. So there was definitely a use of nationalism, but it was much more of a civic nationalism than an ethnic nationalism. Um, and this is also true for most part um, of the radical left in Europe. But there are some exceptions. So. Um, there is a history in the United States to some degree of labor movements engaging in, uh, in, in racialized national stock. And then in Europe, there is, there, we're seeing early signs of leftist parties trying to play with this a little bit, so we're playing with welfare chauvinism, for instance. The argument that, um, that we support a, a generous welfare state, but only for certain kinds of people. Uh, so there's a little bit of it. But for the most part, ethnonationalism, as I, as I defined it here, seems to be the property of the right empirically. Um, so, you know, if you look at the, the, for instance, Latin American leftist populists who had a strong authoritarian tendencies, their kind of uh, uh, politics of representation were actually about bringing in the indigenous and the politically unrepresented into the political process rather than saying, you know, Peru is only for whites. Um, so it's a different kind of uh, use of nationalism. Having said that, um, right, having said that, um, I, you point to something that is a problem. Um, the term radical right, which is an accepted term in the literature, is somewhat problematic in the sense that it, it assumes that the political continuum is, is a single dimension, and it assumes as soon as you articulate ethnonationalism, by definition of fiat, you become radical right. And that's a problem, uh, and that's something I'm aware of, and I'm kind of thinking about using other terms. Uh, so in the Polish case, for, for example, the Law and Justice Party piece uh, combines welfare redistribution, a leftist economic policy, with very strong ethnonationalist politics and authoritarianism. As a result, they get grouped as radical right. Well, in a multidimensional political space, there would be a combination of economic left with maybe cultural right because they're quite conservative on that front. Uh, and so I think there is good reason to complicate the definition and the continuum in which we organize politics. So this is, this is mostly a, um, a, a convention from literature that I've inherited, but, but I, I, I hear your point. Yes, so a lot of us here on Long Island are very aware that we live in a red um, area. And so I'm thinking about how my students would react to your talk, which I love because it's theory driven and that's a wonderful aspect. So, and a lot of us are concerned with data bias. So I think this is relevant to the previous yeah. question. If you were to do your whole exercise again, imagining that your expression of populism was to want to break things as opposed to want to fix them, mm -hmm. which I think would be how I would characterize sure. the difference between the two. Yeah. Um, would you get any different results, and would you use diff would you have been led to different sources of data, and could you identify any bias? I'm not sure. So that's an interesting question. I mean, I think the the what you're referring to is the, the kind of desire to break things. So sort of that's the anti-establishment, anti-institutional orientation of a lot of populist discourse. Um, and in practice, uh, frequently, so that's kind of the politics of this day part. Supporters are just frustrated with partisan politics in general. Um, and so they, they may have sort of certain national cleavages activated, but they also just want to kick the bums out, right? And in fact, a lot of Trump supporters were very critical of the Republican Party as well. And so before I get to other sources of data, although I think you can easily study what you just pointed out using the same data, it's sort of about how you define populism. And in some ways, you know, when I mentioned that populism is an entirely pro-people kind of moral binary, there's also an element of it that is, um, that is critical of representative democracy and representative institution. So that's the breaking things like part. Like having a plan for that, yes. for instance, which is the yes. other approach. Right. You know, and there's actually a great paper, a paper by Oliver Hahn, uh, Amin J. Kim, and Ezra Zuckerman that shows that it's, uh, the title is a little tendentious. It's the authentic appeal of the lying demagogue. Um, but the point is it's an experimental paper that shows that the supporters of radical right actors so radical right actors often violate norms and lie. Their supporters know that they lie. The more they lie, the more their supporters like them. 
it's, which is kind of problematic and hard to deal with politically. But the reason that is the case is that the lying is seen as breaking things. It's seen as being as representing you, who otherwise were not represented before. And so all of a sudden, this person is willing to go on TV and say things that we all know are untrue. Yeah, stick it to the man, right? Like that's great. Do more of that. Which makes fact checking not very useful. It makes all kinds of other responses not useful. Um, but um, but the, to back, come back to the normative question, the presentation is not intended to be normative, and it's not intended to be against right wing politics in general. In fact, it's obviously the case that in any democrat democracy, you need a healthy left and a healthy right. And you know, and I, I stress this repeatedly in my classes, and I taught the class on political sociology during the 2016 election, where this was a really touchy topic. Um, it's not about whether the, it's not about vilifying the right. It's about trying to understand the kinds of politics that um, that tries to overturn existing institutions and norms of, of democratic representation. Right. So it's not about Trump being a Republican. It's about a, Trump being a, a particular kind of radical right let's call it for now, actor, who has captured the Republican Party in a way that many Republicans disagreed with, certainly among the elites, right, in order to break things. Um, so the point is not so much about, you know, left versus right. It's about a kind of radical politics which exists on the right, and again, sometimes on the left, that seems to, that, that, that seeks, seeks to subvert existing institutional norms. Um, but yeah, it's a great point. So I'm thinking about how your work here um, intersects with uh, some work in political sociology on political articulation, and particularly the influence of uh, organizations, and particularly party organizations, on, on the, your findings. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you were to do the same forms of text analysis on, say, party platforms mm -hmm. over time, would we see an increasing congruence? Do party platforms drive this? Yes. Are the parties doing some articulation and organizational work here? That's great. And that's you know what's really exciting about that tradition, so Cedric de Leon and, and Stephanie Mudge and, and others, uh, Barry uh, Eidlin, is that they're picking up party politics, a tradition that's been long again. Um, kind of quiet in sociology, um, as the discipline of Carol. Um, so there are a few different ways to think about this. The first question is, do parties do any work here? Parties do a ton of work here. Um, it's just that that's sort of a division of labor, in my view, is that the political scientists have really focused on parties, party strategies, party systems, uh, without much attention to the cultural part. Where articulation brings it two together, there is some potential for innovation. So the parties have done a couple of things that are useful to think about. First of all, uh, Sherry Berman, for instance, has this argument that as so why is nationalism sailing? As the center left and the center right have converged around economic policy, a neoliberal economic policy over time, that's become less of a distinction between the center left and the center right. So then what becomes much more salient are cultural issues, nationalism and so forth. That's one thing. Um, another way in which we can think about nationalism being, oh, sorry, party politics being important, sort of an argument from Daniel Ziblatt, is that often the center right is in a really difficult situation. So this is like the mainstream Republicans, right? Uh, or center right parties in Europe because they ha they're being attacked from the further down to the right, uh, and they either resist and don't play at all, or they try to co-opt some of the voters on the radical right <coughs> by mimicking the radical rights um, discourse. And that's, there is no easy way out for them. It's actually a really big problem, but that has serious consequences for democracy. So Daniel Ziblatt's work suggests that the, the center right is actually the last bulwark of protection for democracy, not the left. It's the center right, once the center right crumbles, Typically, historically, democratic institutions crumble along the way, and he's shown this historically over the course of the 19th, 20th century, early 20th century. So again, parties <coughs> have to pick strategies that optimize their electoral outcomes while still protecting democratic institutions, and that's very difficult. Um, the other question you had is about whether if we looked at manifestos, we see a difference. So that's, that's what manifestos are party platforms. So that's a really interesting question. I'm looking at party, plat party manifestos in Europe for these frames, and I, you know, I'm hoping to be able to detect them, show how um, they change over time and how they diffuse across countries, across parties, as, as political actors borrow from one another. Um, but there's this question, those are frames. What happens to the policies? And, and which, which uh, social demographic cleavages are parties trying to grasp onto? Um, and you know, and one, one argument is that the reason why moderate Republicans have stuck with Trump is because he's giving them some things they want, right? And them being the elites, but also the, the supporters. So why would evangelicals support Trump when he's clearly at odds with religious dogma, right? 
uh, well, because of Supreme Court seats, right, and because of, uh, of uh, abortion politics. Um, why would mainstream Republicans stick with him when he's clearly at odds with a lot of things they've been saying for many, many years? Well, because of tax policy and so forth. And so there is there is a kind of a um, you know uh, an attempt to 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 contain these actors and get what you want when you're a mainstream center right uh, political party. But it's a dangerous game because once the kind of nationalist you know uh, kind of worms opens up, it's really hard to close it back. Uh, again. So, but yeah, I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of uh, a conversation between the articulation perspective, the kind of largely culturalist perspective I use, and the party politics perspective in political science. I think we have time for one more question. Bart, this was great. I, I really appreciate the use of the surveys and the triangulation with the text analysis. It was fantastic. I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about how Piketty might see this talk. And he's been talking about the role of education and how that has changed across um, economic strata. Yep. So it's not necessarily we're seeing an increase in, in economic and people's well-being, but we're ch seeing changes in education and whether that will play a role in how they feel about, um, about what you are yep. proposing here. That's a great question. So um, first of all, I mean, just sort of the education part aside for now, but, but I'll get to it in a second. There's this broader question of how massively growing inequalities play a role in this in general, right? Um, and they certainly do. Uh, but it's not a clear linear story because you've got a lot of variation in inequality across the countries where we've seen radical right parties emerge. Um, now, the one tweak might be that there is regional within country distribution of inequality so that maybe a country is not, you know, inequality is not rising rapidly like, you know, in Sweden or Norway where we didn't expect populism to emerge and then it did. People wrote dissertations about how Sweden was a negative case until it ceased to be a negative case. But perhaps there is kind of a regional distribution of inequality where their uh, non-urban areas are becoming, you know, kind of getting left behind. And certainly the, in political geography, the urban, non-urban distinction is hugely important for explaining radical right. Voting, um, but on the second part about Big T and, uh, and, and education, so there's a terrific paper, two papers, by my former co-author Noam Gidron and uh, and Peter Hall, Harvard, you know, uh, and uh, and they actually show that education is hugely predictive, not, not just individual education, but kind of the, the contextual differences in education are hugely predictive of support for both radical left and radical right populist parties, and so to the degree that tertiary education grows within the country. Those who don't possess it become more and more uh, disgruntled. Uh, and so as tertiary education becomes a kind of a more prominent status symbol and a more prominent gateway into the labor market, people without it become more and more, so feel more and more left behind. And then they end up voting both for the left and the right to break things <laughs> in a protest vote. And so they show this across countries. Uh, and, and what's fascinating about it is, again, this kind of promise of some of the populist research that you can you can nail down common predictors of, of both radical left and radical right rather than just focusing on the radical right. Um, there, in their formulation, nationalism is more of a downstream consequence. So this is also Danny Roderick has a similar argument. For Danny Roderick, he claims that it's really about um, economic globalization changing the rules of the game in a way that creates grievances on the ground, which then get filtered either through nationalist right politics or through kind of populist left uh, politics, uh, depending on the setting. Uh, so there's definitely something to be said there. The only issue with, with the economic explanation is that it, again, doesn't work in every case. So there, you know, unless you really tweak it a lot. So I think that's where actually education might make more sense than just economic crises or just sheer economic inequality. So that's, that's a great point. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.